I have seen the future. Carry on this mission and cherish it, for it will be your last mission together. Welcome, everybody. It's uh, Mike and Dave with you once again with another Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. discussion. This one, Dave, for the series finale. We told our viewers last time when we did the premiere recap that we would be back. And here we are with our this is being billed as an ending explained. So we'll do our best. (laughs) Yeah. And I'll steal a line that I'm going to use in one of my Lucifer, Lucifer reviews coming up that I stole from the Grateful Dead. What a long, strange trip it's been for the two of us and Marvel Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. Yeah, I started watching Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. before I started working for Den of Geek. We had only been podcasting for a year, I think, when this show first came out. And yeah, it's been quite a ride the past seven years. Um, Overall impressions, uh, just right up front, uh, there's some really weird pieces of this finale. And I'm sure those of you watching out there are, are eager to hear our theories on, you know, what actually happened here. It definitely had its quirky time travel <laughs> bits that we're going to try and explain uh, our best, the best way we can. But I give it an A minus this finale. The the season overall was maybe a B minus, had some ups and downs. Uh, but of course, overall, it's an A plus show. Yeah, no question. And, and you and I have talked about this a lot in, in that. Yes, we like the MCU movies, but we're not huge fans <laughs> of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. I mean, we like it, but we've really gotten into the Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. world, and there's just something about television and what it can do that films can't even approach, really. Exactly, and this has always been my favorite comic book property, and so it's bittersweet seeing it go out like this, but what we're going to do tonight is we're going to talk about mostly the final episode. We're going to sprinkle in a few details, a few comments from that first half of the two of the two hour finale. And uh, in addition to that, fortunately enough, I was able to talk with the cast and crew. They did a one last large press call with all the, the major cast members and the showrunners to talk about uh, the, just the finale in particular, but the show overall as well. So we, we're going to share some of those clips as they become relevant, uh, ho- have some good commentary from the cast to give you some extra details on some of those little quirky elements of the finale. Uh, But basically, Dave, we want to start off with some of the questions that we have overall as we begin our discussion. Right. And I mean, one of the interesting things about this finale is that we have known going into it that this was going to be the last mission for the S.H.I.E.L.D. team. And how do we know that? Well, the time stream says so. (laughs) And... You know, one of your messages to me the past week uh, talking about these final two episodes, you just used the phrase very timey wimey. And yeah, yeah, like you said, we'll we'll do our best to explain how all this stuff fits in in terms of time travel. And and to be honest, Fitz's reappearance almost seems to be a vehicle to explain what the hell just happened over the past you know, whatever time period we're, we're in. So uh, the other thing is not only last mission, but the last time they're going to be physically together in the same room. Uh, I, I guess my question is, well, why? Yeah, why does this that, have that to was be? My, why, why did it actually have to be? That It was a 100% chance, according to Sybil, their predictor. Enoch made that prediction as well. And it definitely was something that Fitz was able to confirm that yes, this would be their last time. But then when the actual coda came and we'll talk some detail about that in the coda that it seemed like it was a choice. A lot of the things they ended up doing. So obviously narratively it had to fit that way because it's the series finale. But yeah, the the prediction that it would be their last mission seemed an option that came upon them 
rather than something they were forced into. Yeah. And, and you know, thinking about what happened in terms of time travel is one thing. I know a lot of hardcore fans are upset and have been upset because of the tie-ins or lack of tie-ins to the greater MCU. And I know you and I have always said, we don't care. <laughs> yeah, We're fine with what we've got. We've got great characters. We've got hateful villains, complex storylines, great action sequences. What else do we need? Right. And I think a lot of it also came from the fact that we had had confirmation that they had diverged from the MCU already. But then when the time travel element came into it, especially discussion of separate timelines, it reminded people of the Avengers and, and the different timelines that happened with the uh, final part of phase three. So it was definitely something where they wanted to compare the, the time travel models between the MCU and shield. And I do think it, it's, it's its own, it's its own animal here. Absolutely. And you know, then we get the question, well, if Jai Ying dies in 1983, how does that impact everything else going forward? Does it specifically the fact that Daisy will no longer be born in that particular timeline. The only person who can answer that question is Deke because Deke is the only one that was left behind in the altered timeline. So we'll talk about that when we get to Deke because uh, definitely he has some experiences moving forward that we can speculate on as to the consequences of this entire season. Right. And, and you know, in terms of timelines, I guess the question, has this timeline been restored Yes. Well, not really did restore it. I guess that'd be kind of the wrong terminology to use because from the standpoint of Piper and Flint and even Fitz inside that container, as well as his daughter, Alia, no time has passed at all. So they just came back to the part point where the timelines diverged. So they didn't really restore the timeline. They just came back to a point before it split okay. off. But, uh, you know, the prime directive f throughout the last few episodes seems to be protect Fitz's location from Sybil and thereby the timeline and the Earth. And and it's been really clear the whole time. And, and of course, the question that has been hanging over fans all season long, when's Fitz going to get back? And there are polls. Uh, he'll be back for the last episode. He'll be back for the last two. And obviously he sort of came back in episode 11 and you know we get him back for the two episode finale how'd you feel about that well that was a tricky one and in fact that was brought up in the press call with the showrunners uh one of the other um journalists asked that question and it really was something where they were in a bind and and i think marissa tantrone and jed whedon are throwing themselves at the mercy of the fans and saying listen you have to understand we were at the mercy of Ian DeCastiger's schedule. We had no choice. It's not that they wanted to have Fitz out of the picture. It fit, it fit. I think the writers did a great job of making his absence work, but it was painful to wait uh, that long period of time. And if you remember too, we actually knew from prior press materials at the beginning of the season that uh, Flint and Piper would be back. But I think most of us just forgot about that. Oh, absolutely. And they showed up, of course, in the finale, too. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, the whole thing about Fitz hanging out in the ether or wherever he was, uh, I guess on the one hand, I forgot about him. And to say that it gives Simmons a chance to be her own person really isn't fair because she's been able to be her own person, even with Fitz. But there's just something about her without Fitz that I, I just saw uh, so many changes in her character. I don't want to say for the better. That's probably not fair either, but whether it's the relationship she develops with Daisy or just the, the person she's become, I, I just really like the fact that we got to see Simmons without Fitz. But at the same time, I would argue that we discussed in our premiere breakdown how she seemed very sad. And we didn't know why at the time. Right. We knew, of course, that Fitz was gone and that that was part of it. But we didn't know anything about the memory implant or anything like that. So I think that was kind of very, uh, a very telling part of Elizabeth Henstrich's 
performance that she was able to bring that forward. And of course that amplified our missing of fits. Yeah, a- absolutely. Um, really cool. The way they get everybody together at the shield, New York city safe house with that 084 message. Uh, why are you here? Well, I got the message. You got the message. And, and so I really like the way they bring that together and the way Simmons starts to piece together fragments of her memory. Um, obviously we know there are only going to be 84 minutes for this to happen or not happen. And, and I think we all knew going in, it was going to happen some way, somehow, but obviously it leads to Fitz just literally dropping into the scene and we, we know it's him, but what a cool helmet and outfit and just what a great That's, reveal. Wasn't it kind of reminiscent of the helmet that he was wearing uh, in season five where he came, you know, through his slow time travel that he experienced getting to the the future that had Earth quaked apart? I think it's that same helmet that he was wearing for there, that as well. But yeah, a very triumphant return and, you know, having shield destroyed for all intents and purposes in episode 11 and having the remnants of shield converge upon that safe house, including Victoria hand who would eventually become the head of, uh, or one of the higher ups in shield that, that we saw both in the movies and at the beginning of, Se- of shield in season one was a nice touch as well. So the fact that they maybe trusted Colson right away is understandable given the, given the dire circumstances and the mysterious nature of this message that had brought them all there to begin with, with their artifacts to put together. Do you remember a few years ago when we worried what was going to happen to Colson when <laughs> yeah. they killed him off? And oh my gosh, but Fitz drops, I don't want to say the first of many, just certainly a bombshell when he reveals core is the key. And of course we know core is important. We know she's Daisy's sister. We know she's, ultra powerful but to be the key to all this it really sets up a cool story that again has to be resolved very quickly because she's not on team shield as the finale begins and in that uh, fits i think was thinking that she would be based on the possibilities that he saw in the time stream now it's it's tricky thinking how he was able to do what he did throughout the course of the season. Because in my mind, he was in that little box that Piper and Flint were guarding for moments. And yet we hear tell of him setting those destinations from decade to decade for the Zephyr to jump around so that they could stay in step with the Chronicoms. So on that hand, I was thinking, okay, maybe Fitz is in that quantum realm, that little in-between space that they spend a little time in in the finale. And maybe he was observing things from there. But they leave that purposely vague. But obviously he had to think of Korra being the key from something. Maybe he was able to look at the time stream the way that Sybil was, where she kind of drew the strings apart, you know, like that, where she could see the different possibilities or something to that effect. Um, but, you know, I, I kind of admire the fact that S.H.I.E.L.D. doesn't think you have to explain every last bit of how and why you just kind of have to piece it together yourself and understand that, you know, sometimes time loops come back on themselves and people have a moment pass, whereas everyone else has years pass. And that's just the way it is with, with a time travel plot. Well, yeah. And you certainly can look at it from the standpoint that the core of the story is about the people and their relationships and their their development as people over the seven years of the series and that it's perfectly okay to answer these questions by saying quantum bridge time travel. Okay. That's it. And plus, he doesn't even frame it that way. He says that it can traverse timelines. So in a way, it's time travel in one of those many branching theory uh, type of of time travel shows. So you're jumping between multiple parallel universes. So it's kind of a mixture of those two sci-fi ideas. Yeah. And if you'd been caught up on dark, we could, uh, insert that concept, but (laughs) my lips are sealed since you're, uh, you're very behind, but that's a story for another day. Um, I love the way Fitz gets the time stream. 
Enoch learns how to be an outlaw from Fitz, <laughs> steals a copy of the time stream, and uh, Flint steals a piece of the time monolith. And Very key. Very key to traveling back in time. I like that detail because that was told in a series of um, quick flashbacks. It was like a montage while Fitz was voicing over his explanation, right? Right. And Flint had that piece of the rock that he was able to do in season five. Same deal. Because you remember, travel to the past isn't as easy as travel to the future. That's why season seven went forward decade by decade. Uh, they only had that one major trip to the past. And and the monolith is key to being able to do that. So having that little key detail for those time travel nitpickers like me. <laughs> good right. job. Right. And, and ordinarily, I'm a show don't tell kind of guy. But but again, I understand the kinds of time constraints they're up against. And who better to explain things than Fitz? And, and you know, a, as you said, he does. And we get, you know, we get the background of Gemma, Fitz, Enoch going to the Alia star system that, again, they have their daughter and that was one of the things that briefly confused me as I tried to piece together her age. And you reminded me that, well, it took them a few years to actually invent the time machine. So yeah. she had time to, to grow up a little bit. And, and that's one thing that a lot of time travel shows don't do. We like a lot of time travel shows, Dave and I. Continuum, 12 Monkeys, Dark, as, as Dave just mentioned, and many others where they're quite complex, but very few of them actually allow the time traveler to take their time because if you think about it they've got as much time in the world as they want because they can just return to that instant that they want to change and so it made for a very nice narrative choice to allow Fitz and Simmons to have a life together and to have that daughter and you know work on the time machine because it obviously took a lot of time uh, but it, it did in season five as well they were old before they completed the time machine in that iteration because they didn't have the help of of Enoch but with this one, it really allowed us to say, okay, we didn't have fits this entire season, but they were together. Right, exactly. And, and the other thing that's easy to overlook because I did it myself is, well, this is Deke's mom. <laughs> yeah. Right? So, exactly right. Um, what about the blue hazmat suits? Well, interestingly, I thought it was very cool to involve Sousa, for one thing, but Sousa, Yo Yo, Fitz, and Simmons were the reinforcements that Simmons called for at the end of season six. And, you know, they helped clean up the temple. And I thought this was kind of cool because perhaps at the end of season six, the writers had a different explanation for that. And here in season seven, they had an opportunity to tie up a loose end that people would have looked back and said, wait, who were those guys <laughs> that helped out at the end of season six? And what we have is our first clip here that we're going to share with you from an interview with the showrunner the showrunners, uh, Marissa Tancheroan and Jed Whedon. And Jeff Bell will chime in as well a little bit about that choice. Why did they choose to do that? And, you know, what was the decision? What was the conversation that happened in the writer's room surrounding having that cool little moment? I wanted to ask you guys about the um, decision to have the blue hazmat suits mirrored from the season six finale in the season seven finale, because that was really a, a neat trick. So what was the writer's room conversation about that? Jed, take it away. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna, let me tee you up. It wasn't hard enough just to do time travel. Jed thought, yeah. you know what would be really cool? If they were the ones that, yeah. yeah. I was well, like, well, it was easy to do in season six, because truthfully, we could have made them what, we just made sure they were tall enough to be our characters in season six. We weren't positive we would be able to pull that off. <laughs> Um, so we could have, you know, because you don't see them, it actually was easy to front load that idea because you don't see them. So they could have been anyone. And if we had to, we could have ditched the concept and had them be chronicoms or something. But it was part of the goal was to have that little extra, because that's the fun and also the nightmare of the time travel stories is when they loop on themselves. And so, you know, while I, I'll say it was somewhat rewarding to have that happen, it caused a lot of mental stress to many well, my, members of the... I remember being on the set and Kevin, Marissa's brother, was directing. Yeah. And we were trying to explain, no, no, this point of view can't be that point of view because they can't see it. And he was, his head was exploding. Yeah, and yeah. Our, our first AD, who's the most supportive 
Keith Potter, the most supportive gung ho guy ever, came up to me and he goes, You know, I love all your episodes and everything. I hate this one. I hate this. <laughs> He's like, You broke me. Yeah. You broke you me. You broke yeah. me. And also, you know, we had all that last act that we really wanted to sit and breathe. So all of it had to be, you know, it's like, Lucen, 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 Lucen. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, and of course, that was just one of many different pieces that they were able to tie up. The, the other favorite of mine was the fact that Sybil was the one that shot that missile that destroyed the temple, thinking she was destroying the Zephyr 1, when in actuality, it just destroyed the temple as they went back in time and started season seven. The other neat piece that I think ties up nicely is that if you pay very close attention, all the different duplicates, because the hazmat suit folks in, in some cases like yo-yo was helping herself right uh, uh, and, and stuff like that so there were duplicates but they were all taken care of all the different copies were taken care of some by jumping back to 19 the 1930s and some through other means but boy did they really <laughs> they really dotted their i's and crossed their t's on this one okay and anybody that's followed the two of us podcasting over the years knows that I always defer to you for explanations related to time travel. So in terms of the plan to save the timeline and allow them to not restore it, as you said earlier, but to return to it, we need Cora to generate enough power to keep the quantum bridge open. Is uh, that... well? That power came from another source. I think that was Fitz's original idea. Okay. That's why he was asking, where's Cora? You didn't, you didn't bring her with you? Well, we can figure something else out. And that's where they drew on the, the power grid, <laughs> the New York power grid. And Deke started hooking up a lot of things with the help of the people that were there in the Swordfish safe house. But Cora was also key, of course, in amplifying the signal of May's empathy powers, which were a great addition to season seven. We didn't get a talk, chance to talk about that in the premiere discussion that we did. Boy, ha having uh, that empathy sort of turn the Chronicoms off, you know? Sure. Sure we're your friends, as we always have been. <laughs> right. But where was the portal that they traveled through? Well, th and that's the thing, too. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about this a little bit, but you know, Fitz was perfectly fine with just leaving the Chronicoms behind and going back to their original timeline without them. Right. And screw this alternate universe. They'll just have to deal with the Chronicoms themselves. But Coulson kind of feels a responsibility to the people that they've come to know in this timeline during their time here. And so um, they're going to take their Chronicoms with them. So that that bubble was uh, also amplified. Is that what you meant by Cora? Yes. She, yeah. she was able to do that. Yeah. Yeah. OK. And. Certainly, we've talked about the shipping angles and Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. over the years, and I don't know that there's a show that does it better, because obviously we all know some shows, that's the main focus. And if that's your main focus, man, you better have a damn good storyline, because that's really not enough. And, and S.H.I.E.L.D., it's almost like they just weave it in and you hardly notice it. Obviously, as we get to the end, a lot of us are thinking like, what about Susan Daisy? And yeah. then when we learn that, well, somebody's got to stay in 1983 and keep the system open, and Sousa steps up and volunteers, and I think most of us are thinking, well, no, you can't do that, but it's so Sousa. It's what he would do. And while we know Daisy would understand and at that point we're not sure how daisy really feels about him i mean as if she didn't any have of, a chance to object it, it, and, and as if any of them had a chance to really sit down and think about how they truly do feel and then the god of rock and roll steps forward and says <laughs> nah i'll stay he just kind of goes <laughs> right and perfect timing and again it's just so perfect and he even says you know, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about fan service in, in the ending. And again, I, I don't know how you could have done things better. But he even mentions, you two need to be together. I'll stay. And Yeah, it gave that last moment. Because people may have been wondering, how does Deke feel about this whole Daisy and Sousa thing that's going on? But this give him, gives him a chance to say, okay, I'm done with my lemon quest <laughs> to go after Daisy. And yeah, he's got a good life here. He can actually 
go about his uh, stealing proprietary <laughs> exactly prop- <laughs> as much as he wants. Mac won't have anything to object to. <laughs> exactly, nor will Coulson. And we also get that scene where Melinda May drops in and we know how she feels about being referred to as the cavalry. It's a very painful subject yet here it is one last time and it's just perfect. And she descends in the fight to save Cora and you know, you know, that whole question that she and Coulson banter about, you know, did we change the timeline or did the timeline change us? And it's such a fundamentally basic question that has no answer, really. Well, and the other piece of that, which is key to that conversation, great conversation from episode 12, is the fact that the old May would have never asked that type of philosophical question. Sure. And Colson points that out. And he says, you know what? But I like the new you. And if I'm being honest, I kind of like the new me as well. And that conversation is going to have to be satisfying for a lot of fans that maybe we're hoping for a Felinda uh, shipping angle to, to end up with things, which it did not. So I have a clip to share with you now at this point from an interview with, uh, I think in this group it was um, Henry Simmons and Ming-Na Wen and Natalia Cordova Buckley. But I uh, honed in on Ming-Na's journey as an actress, being able to take this very emotionless version of May and bring it forward to a much more like her her real life self kind of character, because of course Ming Na Wen is very vivacious, yes. <laughs> and so Melinda May uh, d- definitely went through an evolution in season seven that she did not in the previous six. So here she is talking about that transformation. Hi guys, uh, this question actually is for Ming. And I wanted to know, since obviously the emotionless nature of (laughs) the character uh, got to evolve, maybe a little bit closer to the real life Ming Na Wen, was it refreshing to bring, be able to bring a different kind of performance to your character this season? Uh, Well, yeah, later in the next few episodes into the uh, season, because the first like three, you know, she was, even less emotional and she had no emotions, which was, I mean, I was like, really, you're going to go in that direction? Really? (laughs) And uh, so it was tough, but then when she became an empath and I was able to explore uh, emotions of other people through May, uh, it was definitely a lot of fun um, too. Yeah. And challenging, but, but it's also a power that she absolutely hates having. Okay, that was a short one, but that was a good one to uh, illustrate that point because I think she definitely, um, you know, had her own thing going on. And, and it's funny that in the coda, which we'll talk about, she actually expresses dissatisfaction about her ending <laughs> initially, although perhaps a, a bit facetiously. But uh, we'll see how we feel about that when we get to that discussion. Yeah. But her powers of empathy were crucial in this battle. If if she hadn't had that, they would not have been able to sh- shut down the hunters despite Daisy blowing up the three Chronicom ships with Sybil on board and Nathaniel Malik on board, they still would have had to deal with all those soldiers. And because of May's power, they no longer have to. Right. Now, if only Elizabeth Henstridge could be that animated in real life on her YouTube (laughs) channels. Um, You know, we talked a little bit about Simmons and and there are some great scenes in, in this episode as she's trying to recover her memory. And of course we get that one point where we're worried that it's going to be one of those deals that she doesn't know anybody. And when she sees Daisy, why are you wearing that costume? Yeah, we're that like, was a great moment. Oh no. Can I get one? <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> and it's just, it's just so awesome. The way that those lines are delivered by, by the two of them who apparently have become great friends in real life. And it, it certainly comes across. You know. Oh my gosh. And we'll talk about this when we get to Daisy, but yeah, the dynamic between those two and the fact that Daisy has that great line about um, having a sister already to save. And her name is Gemma Simmons. Yes. Oh, and and she, that, that whole idea about, I know what we're fighting for. Family. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and I think w- most of us probably saw that coming because they did use that phrase you know, 
do you know what we're fighting for? I think Coulson says that to Cora. Do I need to tell you what that is? And she says no. And I don't think they need to tell us what it is either, even though it takes the entire episode for Daisy once she has sacrificed herself to destroy those Chronicom ships and is then saved by Korra, resuscitated from the depths of space, uh, she's able to verbalize the fact that family is what they've been fighting for this whole time. And it takes place with Korra and Daisy. It takes place with Alia and Fitz and Simmons and the whole S.H.I.E.L.D. family as a whole, right? Right. And, you know, that, that attempt by Daisy to connect to this sister that she didn't know she had. And it, it takes us back to season one of that young woman in her van outside of, you know, shield headquarters and how far she's come that she had no family. And, and there have been a number of instances over the seven seasons where, you know, it, it really has become an emotional uh, moment for her, you know, recognizing that maybe some of her family is going to be lost or, or, or whatever. But um, we also see her growing closer with Sousa. And, you know, I mentioned a few minutes ago, neither of them's really had a lot of time to process how this relationship might unfold, if in fact it does. And he kisses her before she begins that solo mission and yeah it's just a great scene i mean of, of course the fans love it how could you not but but it also plays into what we're going to see down the road yeah exactly and and i think it's important to note that they did a great job of pacing that such that not only did you placate those who maybe wanted daisy to end up by herself because we we've talked about it sure even even in that premier discussion how daisy as a character has been on her own and it's kind of nice that it's been that way, despite Lincoln and the thing with Ward and other things across the seasons. But people who even maybe wanted Sousa to end up with Peggy Carter. Somehow the writers were able to reconcile both of those things and actually put this pairing together in a way that had us all rooting for it. That's yeah. no small feat. So I, I got to give them credit for making us all. I, I think they called it either Susie or Doozy, the ship name. For yeah. Sousa and Daisy, I'm not sure. Well, all I know is he better get the uh, photo of Agent Carter out of his wallet before Daisy finds <laughs> it. But, uh, yeah, and and then, you know, we get to the end. And look, I, I mean, we could debate for hours whether or not the, uh, the villains of season seven were the weak link. And yeah. <laughs> you probably could make a case for that. Uh, Nathaniel, you know, yeah, I hate him. Yeah, but I don't know. It is what it is. And I think the important thing here is he tells her that, you know, there's no way to kill me without killing yourself. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Got it. I'll do it then. Right. And yeah, it, it's funny with the evolution of this character, uh, the way Daisy has become self-sacrificial because they did have a few moments where she was really saying, I think to Colson at one point or, or some, no, it was, it was Mac who was saying, Oh, well, if this is our last mission, you know, maybe that's for the best. And she's like, listen, this is my fa I have no other family. Right. If I'm ending with shield, what am I supposed to do? So there were some quite poignant moments there. And that's why the thing with, with, um, Simmons is so cool, the, the whole sisterly thing. In fact, let me go ahead and share a clip real quick because I, I skipped over that earlier where Chloe is talking about not only Simmons and Daisy and that relationship, but the relationship between Chloe Bennett and Elizabeth Henstridge, which is very key, especially since there was a Daisy-centric episode that Elizabeth Henstridge directed, yes. that time loop oh. episode, which was by far the best episode of the season. No question. Far none. And uh, so we're, we're going to take a quick listen. This one's a little bit longer, about five minutes, but um, you'll hear Clark Gregg chiming in a little bit on this idea as well. So here's Chloe talking about uh, her and, and her friendship with Elizabeth Henstridge, who directed a, a, an episode of Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. this season. I wanted to ask a little bit about, because uh, one of my favorite lines from Chloe was, I already have a sister to save, and her name is Jim. Oh, I love that. And... Oh. Because you had such a Daisy-centric episode that was directed by Elizabeth, uh, can you talk a little bit about you know what that filming that episode was like? Because you got to have the highs of 
emotion and also some great moments of comedy. It was so special. And I mean, I could talk about this for 17 hours, but it really, it, it, it really hit me. I think, you know, the, the uh, grasping, the understanding that we were kind of really wrapping started kind of with that episode. And I remember just being in that freaking pod that I had to wake up in 800 times. And it was our first day of set and just like laying there and kind of watching Elizabeth from the corner of my eye with her director headset and, and, you know, just so poised and so it's really, really hard for a young woman to walk onto a set that she's been on every day as an actress and as a young actress, and then and really come in and take control and, and do it so, so balanced. And the, the way that you have to, you know, every crew member th- be taken seriously, but don't take yourself too seriously. You know, there's, there's such, it's so hard to do. And it really just like made my entire experience on the show kind of flash before my eyes. And, you know, I, I flash back to meeting Elizabeth and the journey that we've been on together as two young women going through like a, a, a something that's really, really, difficult to do you know we were the we were the first show to do a lot and we've been on for a really long time and we've grown so much together and so to see how far we've come that was just incredibly special and she's also just you know it's like when Clark directs it's such a special treat because there, unless a director's come in and seen every single episode of the show there's going to be nuance to each character that you just don't quite understand and so when someone like Elizabeth or Clark directs it's like it's a it's like a it's a treat because there's some there's less explaining you have to do there's less like oh i don't have to you know they understand it and they they and they also understand the comedy of like where everyone really and so it was such a special experience and and it was a hard episode to shoot i mean we we definitely i want to i want to chime in on this one too first of all she said she just wanted to do an episode and then stayed and watched every director I think for like 15 episodes over like a year to prepare. And she took on one of the hardest ones we've ever done with such comic and dark tone with so many logical time constraints and directed, it might be my favorite episode of the show. I'm not going to lie. Just there's ways that it works on all those levels. That's really just incredible what she pulled off. I'm really excited to see what she directs next. And of, of, of all the other things. And she also really brought home the first weird little moments of the ship between you and um, Sousa in a way that felt completely unforced. And that was the hardest beat, I think, to do is, is this a thing? And I thought she killed that too. You guys helped some, but she really, <laughs> really. That was, it's a really hard like line to <laughs> to walk of going like, okay, so we have to buy this and by the middle of this episode, they are kissing. And how do we not only have Daisy understand each time loop and process that she's in a time loop, that they're, you know, all of the, every single thing that, okay, now this one, I have to go do this. And, but also with all that logistic bullshit, there was also at the same time, she had to be kind of falling for Susa. So there was like, you know, my brain was fried and thank God she was there. That's Arthur. Like, it was crazy. It's my dog. Arthur, I am on my final Zoom call for Shield. Please. Thank you. Um, thank you. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, you heard there at the end, that was her dog, which I thought was a very authentic moment for that part of the interview. But, yeah, she this square off that she has with Nathaniel actually helped uh, helped me uh reconcile the fact that nathaniel wasn't that great of a villain in fact i really liked the fact that in the end it turned out that nathaniel wasn't even really all that gung-ho about anarchy after all but actually was wanting to rule the world along with cora and he even slips up at one point where he accidentally says rule over the world i mean the chaos that will reign everywhere you know but in the end you know the fact that she was able to defeat sybil and nathaniel with a sacrifice that was able to be creditably undone, not undoing the stakes as we've talked about before with some of the deaths in Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. They did a great job. Right. And, you know, talking about coming back from the dead, uh, I was fine how they did it. But again, as a villain, it was quick. the return, of, well, I was talking about the return of Garrett. 
That, oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's okay. But l- let's talk about the coda. Yes. And we see across the screen one year later, and I'm looking at my TV. I'm like, well, we got a lot of time left. I, I wonder how they're going to use this. And that time just flies by. Of course, we're wondering what happens to the timeline. And as I alluded earlier in the discussion, we see everybody together. And of course, we're thinking, well, wait a minute, you're not supposed to have gotten together. And then I forget who the first one to sort of blink out a little bit. And we get the idea. Oh, it was Daisy because she's off in the nebula. or something. Right. <laughs> On Zephyr three, apparently. So yes, yes, yes. They did a lot of building in only a year. But it's just a great scene. And then after everybody leaves the room, it's just perfect that it's just Daisy and Colson. And I'm telling you, if you're if you didn't get emotional when she says it's funny what can happen when someone believes in you, then you have no heart. Right. She was talking about Cora. Yes. But we know she's yes. talking about herself. <laughs> exactly. And Colson and how he basically raised her as his child. And yes, she's going to do the same with Cora. You know, we see that, you know, later in, in the episode. But it's just such a poignant line, maybe the most poignant of the season, especially for me. Mac is still the director, I assume. Well, yeah, and that's the thing. We we have to make a lot of assumptions. And I like how they did this. The dialogue didn't give us any hints, you know. Right. They just talked about, you know, so what are you what's up with you and what's up with that? It wasn't until we actually saw the visual of them disconnecting from the call right. that we got to see what truly was happening in their lives. Yes. And Mac standing on a helicarrier I I guess there's really no reason he shouldn't still be director. He saved the world for crying out loud. He kind of looked like uh, Fury in a way with that long coat. So very evocative of earlier directors. Right. And we know his relationship with Yo-Yo is still going. She's, I guess, his top agent. That's sort of the way it's presented. She's working with Piper, who you mentioned, and LMD Davis. That's not explained, but what else? (laughs) Is, is, is Yeah, I feel like he's kind of been brought back the same way Colson has with a some kind of digital download. Although, you know, that was explained by his, by his time in the framework and having gone through the machine several times. Right. I'm not sure how they explained it with Davis. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, whatever. Um, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah. What would you think about May as a lecturer at the Colson Academy? Yeah, which I assume is just a the S.H.I.E.L.D. Academy which has been named for Colson, right. I'm assuming. But yeah, that was kind of cool because, like I said, Melinda May said at first, you know, I hate my job. But Colson was like, no, you don't. You're just saying that, <laughs> you know. It's a lot of stress for her. But I don't know that it totally fits with my idea of her as a character. But, you know, it's what they decided to go with. So I'm fine with it. Right, And I guess I look at the development of her character, whether she still has the, you know, super empathy power we don't really know or not but it's not as if there's anything wrong with her memory so even if she doesn't still have that power she remembers it and she remembers how she felt around other people so i'm okay with that was that flint with her that was flint okay i I thought so so he's i guess going to be a official shield agent at some point if he's not already in human powers so i'm sure he'll be One of their top agents, just like Yo-Yo. Right. Uh, Daisy and Sousa together on Zephyr 3 with Korra. And, you know, as as we said a few minutes ago, I I, I think the sister bond will will develop much the same as it did with uh, Daisy and Simmons. And, of course, they are linked by blood. But I think we know with Daisy, it doesn't matter. You know, I'll cut my hand and Simmons can cut her hand and we're linked by blood, too, or whatever. So, yeah. so the three of them are Astro ambassadors. Is that what they said? That's Sousa's kind of goofy fifties term for it. <laughs> and it was perfect. But I like that because it acknowledges the fact that shield and the MCU at large does has had a history with other alien races. So it's going to be an important role. Right. And you know, as we approach the final minute of the episode, 
you know, and, and we get the one scene with Fitz Simmons and their daughter and perfect. But dude, when Coulson opens his gift at HQ, <laughs> uh, his gift from Mac, and we, we know immediately what it is. The keys to Lola. I mean, come a on. A new Lola. Yes. That transforms into a black chassis, which yes. is kind of cool. <laughs> yes. So, I, again, him driving, well, he doesn't really drive off. He, he sort of <laughs> <laughs> flies we don't off. need roads <laughs> yeah. from Back to the Future. But you mentioned Alia and Fitzsimmons. And I, again, I apologize. I meant to bring this up earlier. I do have a clip to share with that as well, because I really was curious, where did they find this, this young girl who was just so cute? And uh, some interesting facts that I learned from Ian DeCastiger and Elizabeth Henstridge in, in our discussion with them. And, if, and Jeff Ward was in this group interview as well. So you'll hear him chime in as well, because, of course, Alia is his mother, as we mentioned. So here's uh, Ian and Elizabeth talking about their experience with this young actress on the set and some of the fun challenges that they had, including the fact that she was an American actress affecting a British accent, which she did a spot on job. So here they are talking about that. Hi there. I, I want to ask a question um, of Elizabeth and Ian. Uh, you filmed such great scenes with the young actress playing Alia. Uh, talk about what was the experience like when you were filming the different family scenes. She had such a bright smile. Were those scenes very authentic for you? And of course, Jeff, that's your mom, technically, too. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I, just, I, just I had approval see. on that because she's my mom. <laughs> she, she does, yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. The uh, I'll just quickly say Elizabeth it was really great in that scene there's the last scene with her because that little girl was American and she was what what age was she was four or five yeah. she was American and she was doing a, a British accent which was really incredible for yeah. someone of that age but she was also you know as a younger this is this is um to kind of um back up Elizabeth's directing skills but you know she's a younger girl and it was hard to keep her concentration a little bit Elizabeth was really good in that last scene I remember she would kind of repeat the lines to her and she would say them back but it came out really well. She was so cute. I mean, we don't really work with kids ever on S.H.I.E.L.D. So it felt like, you know, there was this precious cargo on set that you, you know, you're trying to protect at all costs. And there's, her mom was wonderful and she was so cute. And I think it just brought that sense of play that when you have a small child in a scene, you just kind of, play around and figure out, and then it's just capturing those moments, specifically at the end when we were, I mean, we ran around that field, Ian, for hours, and there's literally two seconds of it. I, I mean, we were both like, we are not ready to be parents. This is a lot. I know, and it's fun having a kid on set like that, you know? Adults can be, yeah. you know, when you get kids quite serious and stuff like that, and you lose that playfulness, but having, like, when you've got someone like that around, it's, it can be quite fun on set. Yeah. But you can see in their voices that, obviously, they have a lot of fond memories of the show, which f finished filming quite a while ago. And this was the final press event that S.H.I.E.L.D. was doing. You know, they would have done probably something similar at San Diego Comic-Con had it happened. Right. But this this Zoom interview that we did was actually their last hurrah. And, you know, Chloe Bennett actually got quite teary when Clark Gregg was singing her praises in the interview that they the two of them were in because she realized it right in the middle of the interview that, oh, my gosh, this is the last time we're going to be talking about this in a group like this. And who knows how long it's been since the actors themselves have seen each other. Sure. Yeah. So in a sense, this was kind of like that same virtual meeting that they had in the swordfish bar because that wasn't in person either. Right. And, and here they are, we're seeing them each other through, through the digital construct here. In fact, some of the reporters brought that up. The fact that that final episode was very similar to how we're living our lives now, where we only get to see each other in, in a brief, digital calls through the web. And that's how we're reaching out to you guys now, of course, yeah. in our discussion of the ending. <laughs> yep. Now, you still want to go with the A- minus on this final? Uh... Yeah, well, an A- minus is still an A, Dave. Okay, all right. Dave knows that I'm a little bit more critical with my <laughs> with my ratings. Yeah. Uh, but I did, did give a few very high scores for season seven. And overall, could not be ha happier with the series overall and how they chose to wrap it up. How about you, Dave? Did you enjoy the oh, ending? I, I loved it. And, you know, I, I think anybody that knows me, I was joking about Elizabeth Henstridge. She is <laughs> so much fun to watch on her YouTube channel. If you haven't 
uh, I forget, it's something with Lil, I forget what it is, yeah. but uh, they are just, just tremendous. She's awesome. And, right. and again, I love the way they all make fun of Jeff Ward whenever they're <laughs> yes. together, just as they would Deke. Exactly, exactly. So I hope you enjoyed our discussion and maybe we helped you out a little bit explaining the ending. <laughs> you know, we did our best. I'm sure there are other theories out there that will come about because, of course, we're recording this before the finale has even aired. Right. So I'm anxious to see what the reactions are out there, what the theories are out there. So the discussion can keep going. It doesn't have to stop here. Um, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. fans can engage with each other for years to come. So to all you Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. fans out there, remember what we're fighting for. And we are, as we have always been, Mike and Dave. Thanks for joining us. See you.